Professor Rothkus maintain uh, a well-funded research program in computer networking. Uh, he's one of the well-known researchers in this field. Uh, we are honored to have him today. Uh, he will actually be with us this week, and uh, he will have three lectures, inshallah. This is the first one. The second one will be tomorrow at 11 a.m., and the third one on uh, Thursday, inshallah, at 11 a.m. So please uh, welcome with me Professor George Roskett. Thank you, uh, Dr. Khatib, and uh, uh, thank you all for being here. It's a pleasure to be uh, back in Jeddah. Um, and uh, as Dr. Khatib mentioned, I'll be uh, giving three lectures, uh, and so I'll be happy to talk to you about any of these. Um, also, I'm the director of graduate programs, so if you have any questions about our graduate programs and all that, I'll be happy to discuss with you. Uh, so the, this first talk is actually a research talk um, that will uh, present the results of a research project that we had with uh, KAU. And uh, we've uh, completed these projects. And as you can see, there's a number of collaborators from uh, KAU. Um, uh, without, so we have actually a number of collaborators for the project. Uh, Sahar Talebi is my student at NC State uh, who will be graduating uh, soon. And then uh, there's a number of people from uh, uh, KAU and also Fujitsu, uh, HPC folks from uh, Fujitsu, as you can see here. And then we have collaborators from uh, uh, Paris 6 University in uh, uh, Paris. Uh, so uh, before I uh, get into the details of, the, of my talk, I just want to uh, let you know what the uh, publication results are. And we've actually had seven uh, publications out of this project. Uh, three general publications in the three top uh, optical networking uh, journals uh, uh, in, this, uh, in this particular area. So these are these uh, publications, and I'm going to discuss about this uh, in, in more detail as we go along. <coughs> and then we had uh, four conference publications. In fact, this one uh, was just accepted um, uh, a week ago, and uh, the paper will be presented um, in uh, Las Vegas in August. And there's one other paper that uh, we just submitted uh, to Globcom 2015. So if it is accepted, it will be presented next uh, December. And then uh, Dr. Katib also attended ONDM last May. Uh, we met uh, in, uh, in Stockholm last May, uh, last May where we presented this paper. So, uh, so these are the results. And as you can see, there's a lot of work that has been put into this project. And I have a lot of slides. Uh, and, and, and much of this work is actually very technical. So I'm going to see you know, how I'm going to fit everything. Obviously, I can't fit everything uh, you know, we've done into a one hour talk. Uh, but I'll try to give you the basic idea and give you kind of the insight that we had into these projects and, and get into some of the technical details uh, but um, again, it, it's certainly not possible to include everything that we've done into this uh, talk. So this is the outline, and, and the first I'm going to motivate the, the talk and, and uh, explain why this is an area of research that has actually exploded recently than in the last two or three years. Uh, and then I'm going to discuss the problem that we are uh, addressing here, the routing and spectrum assignments, and I try to give you the insight that we had in tackling this problem, and I'm going to show you why, how this is actually a special case of a multiprocessor uh, scheduling problem. And then I'm going to give you some of the results and some future research opportunities that uh, uh, might be possible to pursue. Okay. So, the elastic optical network. So, you, you know about optical networks, right? So, um, uh, the vast majority of traffic in the internet globally today is carried by optical networks. And although you don't really see optical networks, you see mostly wireless networks. Keep in mind that whenever you download data or make a call, the wireless data only goes one hop to the access points, okay? And then from there goes uh, to the destination using fiber. So pretty much all the traffic in the internet is carried by optical networks. Now, currently what happens is that 
uh, optical networks oper operate in a uh, multi-wavelength uh, modes um, and the um, ITU has standardized the spacing between wavelengths. So what you can see if you can see, probably can see it here. So basically, they have taken the spectrum around 1.5 uh, micrometers and they've sliced it into 50 gigahertz channels. And now you fit the signals into these 50 gigahertz, uh, gigahertz uh, uh, channels. So if you are carrying 10 gigabits or 40 gigabits or 100 gigabits, and these are all commercially possible today, they go into one of these wavelengths uh, which is 50 uh, uh, gigahertz of spectrum, okay? <coughs> now, what is the problem? The problem is that, as you can see here, a 100 gigabit per second signal pretty much takes the whole spectrum here, but if we are talking about 10 or 40 gigabits, we are wasting a lot of spectrum, okay? Now, uh, you know, 15, 20 years ago, people were saying that um, bandwidth is infinite and uh, there is no issue with, uh, you know, uh, carrying, uh, you know, with the fibers because you have multiple wavelengths running into a single strand, you, you can uh, never gonna run out of bandwidth. Well, that's actually not true, okay? With the way that the exponentially growth in data uh, that is uh, carried, and especially as we are coming into a situation where the data is not driven by humans anymore, but is driven by machine-to-machine -machine traffic, this situation is not going to be um, acceptable any longer. So you can't really waste the bandwidth like we do here. And so this, uh, the last three or four years, there have been these calls to develop an elastic networking paradigm where you can take the same spectrum, okay, and slice it into uh, slots in a way that fits the actual amount of traffic that you want to put into it. So if you are only carrying a 10 gigabit per second channel, you have a small slot or a, you know, a smaller number of slots, okay? Uh, if you're carrying a 40 gigabit, you get a bit larger and so on. And that also makes it possible to accommodate higher demands of 400 or 1 terabit per second, which are not commercially available yet, but they are coming. They've been demonstrated in the lab. You know, they, um, they're out, you know, it's, uh, uh, the technology is already there, but, uh, it, it, and it will be deployed commercially soon, okay? Uh, you can't do that here, so you will have to take multiple wavelengths, okay? But here it is actually possible to do that because you are not limited by this 50 gigahertz spectrum you have a much finer granularity, which is down to 12.5 or even 6.25 gigahertz in terms of, of uh, uh, assigning spectrum to your demands. Another uh, interesting uh, possibility that you can do here is uh, you can uh, determine the number of slots based on the uh, signal losses. So if you have a longer path, you may, for the same 10 gigabits, if you're going to a s over a short path, you may allocate a small number of slots. If you're going over a longer path and you have a lot of uh, uh, losses, then you may allocate more uh, slots. This is made possible through um, orthogonal frequency division multiplexing and um, this is a technology that is used for Wi-Fi. This is a technology that is used for DSL um, access, okay? But um, obviously Wi-Fi and DSL is in the electronic domain. Here we're talking about optical OFDM, okay? So this is this um, uh, modulation uh, in the optical domain, okay? So by doing that, you basically, it's a multi-carrier modulation where you take the spectrum, you slice it down very small, uh, slots and then you allocate as many slots as you need to your signal. Okay, that's the whole idea. All right. So, um, so now moving from a fixed grid architecture to a flexible grid architecture, okay, is where this problem of routing and spectrum assignment is introduced. Okay. So this is kind of the definition, the, the working definition that we use. It's a very general definition of the problem. Basically what it says is the following. This is a, 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 we can think of that as a network design problem, right? So what we have is we have a traffic demand matrix that says, okay, so you have a topology, that's your network. You have a traffic demand matrix that says I need to carry so much traffic from point A to point B, okay, between the various nodes. 
And now what you want to do is you want to take the demand, route it over your network, okay, and assign an appropriate amount of spectrum to your demand, okay. And you, there are three constraints that you need to, um, uh, <coughs> uh, to obey here. Spectrum contiguity, spectrum continuity, and non-overlapping spectrum, okay. I'm going to explain them in a moment uh, with the with figure, okay? Now, if the route is given, so if to go from A to B, you actually know what the path is, and that's part of the problem, then routing is not an issue anymore, and the problem reduces to a spectrum allocation rather than a routing and spectrum allocation. So, so you have two issues, the routing and spectrum assignment, the RSA, which is more general, and then the spectrum assignment only if the path is given. So let's uh, discuss uh, this, these constraints and why these are important. Okay, so as I said, there are three, spectrum contiguity, continuity, and non-overlapping. So this is a small network, all right. Let's say I have this demand of 40 gigabits that goes from N1 to N4 via N2 here. And so I'm going to use the two links, N1 to N2 and N2 to N4. That's my route. And I'm going to allocate a number of uh, slots that correspond to this particular demand. Okay, so let's say this is a 40 gigabit per second demand, so it needs uh, quite some, small, uh, you know, quite a few slots. So spectrum contiguity means that the slots have to be next to each other. Okay, so in the spectrum, you have to give slots that are contiguous with each other, okay, to carry the traffic. Spectrum continuity means that if I'm using these two links, then I have to assign the same number of slots on both links, so here and there, okay? So this is the link N1 to N2, this is the link N2 to N4, and as you can see, they have as, uh, been assigned the same slot, so if you look at this as as the spectrum, okay, they've been assigned the same slots, okay. And then the non-overlapping part says that um, if you have demands that um, uh, cross the same link, as you can see here, then they have to be uh, non-overlapping, okay. So as the N1 to N2, you have three demands, and these three demands take slots from different parts of the spectrum. All right, so these are the three demands that, that are necessary. And these are the three uh, constraints that are necessary. Okay. Now, the first thing that we do, uh, at least in the way that I try to do research, is when I start into a new area, I try to understand the, uh, you know, the literature, right, what has already been done. This is the first general paper that, that we published here, is that we actually looked at, uh, you know, we did a survey of the various spectrum management techniques, uh, and so, uh, uh, this was published last July, it has already received about 10 uh, citations uh, in, a, in about nine months, so, so I think uh, this is doing well. Um, and um, uh, so, so we have um, a, a really broad classification of the various techniques uh, in, in this. It's, uh, it's actually a, a long paper, about 15 pages or so. so. So pretty much everything you need to know about RSA is, is all, you know, for the work that has already been done uh, is um, uh, included here. And this is, you know, this is just my one slide summarizing what we have in the paper, <laughs> okay? Um, again, it's, you know, I would probably need one hour to explain all these techniques um, uh, that, that we have there. But basically, if you look at, you know, the, the whole universe of approaches, there are uh, uh, two main approaches. One is to try to find uh, exact solutions, and exact solutions typically formulate the problem as a linear, uh, you have an integer linear for, uh, formulation. Um, and there are different types of formulations depending on what are the entities of interests that are to express in the ILP, uh, whether it is link-based, path-based, or channel-based. Channel-based is actually a specific um, uh, or a very specific uh, type of ILP just for, um, uh, for the RSA problem. Uh, again, I'm not going to get into this. Uh, of course, the main issue with those, with these formulations, they don't scale, right? And typically what you see in these uh, papers that they, what they will do is they will say, okay, here's a version of the problem, here's an ILP formulation, 
Um, here's the results on a five node network, right? Five node network is a toy network, really. And well, it doesn't scale, so by the way, here's a heuristic, okay? And so the heuristics uh, typically fall into one of these categories. One is to decompose the problem. You have routing and spectrum assignment. Well, what if I solve them uh, independently? Let me do the routing first somehow. And then once I have the routes, then I solve the spectrum assignment. And uh, if I have the, r the routing, then you can use mm, some type of um, you know, uh, sortest path algorithm to solve it, okay? Um, the spectrum assignment, then you can use uh, various uh, policies like uh, random policy or first fifth policy to fit the, uh, the demands into the spectrum, okay? So this is fun, uh, and the other approach is to, uh, 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 to solve the MILPS either is a, a technique called column generation, okay? Or you uh, relax the integer constraints and now you get a linear program that you can solve very quickly, okay? And then do some kind of rounding, uh, you know, to, um, uh, yeah, because you know you, you have integer constraints. If you relax them, you get real values as the result. Then you can do some kind of rounding to get to the integer solution that you are looking for. Okay. Uh, problem with some of these, either the decomposition or the LP and plus rounding, is that two things. One is, you know, you find a good solution. How good is that? It's very difficult to say how good that solution is. The second issue is that it uh, may not be even possible to find a feasible solution because, okay, you've done the routing, then you try to do your uh, spectrum assignment, uh, but, the spectrum, but the routing was done suboptimally. And if it hasn't been done correctly, then you may not even be able to find a feasible solution. The same thing with the rounding techniques and all that, okay? So what we, <coughs> when, when we looked at this problem, we said, okay, you know, these are classical network design techniques, okay? Is there something else that we can do that we can solve this problem and be able to get uh, solutions that we can characterize, you know, how good they are, okay? And this is where the insight is. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna describe to you two problems, okay? Scheduling problems, I'm gonna show you how they are related to RSA and SA, okay? Uh, this is the definition, but I'm not going to talk about the definition. I'm going to give you an example, okay? Suppose that there's a patient in a hospital that needs to undergo heart surgery, okay? So for a heart surgery or any type of surgery, you obviously have to have a doctor who specializes in, let's say, the heart surgery, okay? You have to have an anesthesiologist, okay, who's going to be there and uh, delivering the um, anesthesia and making sure that the, 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 the patient is doing okay while he's under. And then you probably have to have uh, one or two or three nurses, right? So when, they, when you say, that, you know, so l look at, from the point of view of the hospital, the hospital has lots of patients that come in and they have to have various procedures. And so what they have to do is they have to schedule a heart surgery and heart surgery means they have to schedule the heart surgeon, the anesthesiologist, um, the three nurses, and, and maybe any other stuff that is needed, okay? And this stuff have to be at the same time, in the same room, all working on the, on the patients, okay? So if you think about this problem, okay, this is exactly a multiprocessor scheduling where you have some tasks, these are the patients, they have to undergo processing, which is the surgery, the surgery lasts for a period of time, so this is the processing time of the task, okay? And then there is a set of processors that will be working on the task, and this would be the two doctors and the three nurses, let's say, that are working on the surgery, okay? And what you want to do, because you are at a hospital and you want to uh, better, you, you know, uh, uh, <coughs> Um, optimize the utilization of your resources, you want to schedule those procedures so that you minimize the amount of time it takes to do all of them, right? Because if, if you have a lot of idle times, that means your staff is not really working those times, okay? That's exactly what this multiprocessor scheduling problem is, and this is a, a problem that has been studied for a long time, okay? And when you do this scheduling, you have these three constraints, no preemption, 
you know, once you start a heart surgery, you can't stop it in the middle, go do something else, and then come back, right? So no preemption. Uh, the simultaneous processing of each task on the processor. So, um, you know, all the doctors and the nurses have to be working there at the same time on the patient. And okay, and um, each processor has to work on at most one task. So a heart surgeon cannot be doing two operations at the same time, right? So once they have to complete one before they move to the next one. Okay, so this is. So think about this uh, a scheduling problem with four processes, uh, process one, two, three, four, okay. Uh, this is a task that requires all four of the processors. Uh, this is a task that requires only processors one and three, so the, the yellow one, one and three, okay. Uh, this is a task that requires processors one, two, and four, one, two, and four, okay. So if I have these tasks, then the question is how do I schedule them so that I make sure that these constraints are satisfied, okay? So obviously, a, a processor, as you can see here, only works on one task, okay? One task is always worked on by all the processors at the same time, okay? And um, there is no preemption. You never, you don't stop this task and then come back to that, okay? So once you start the task, you complete everything. So I want to, I want to uh, schedule these tasks so as to minimize the finish time, okay? And inevitably, because of um, you know the way that these tasks are um, given to you, <coughs> inevitably you won't be able to schedule without having some idle time. So this is an optimal scheduling fact for this set of tasks, but you can't avoid having idle times. All right. Now there's an obvious lower bound here, I can see, I don't think that there's a, yeah. So uh, let's say this processor only has this gap over here, so you can think of the sum of all the tasks on this processor as a lower bound, but obviously you can't always get to the lower bound because you can't have perfect scheduling, okay, because of the way that these tasks are given to you. All right, so <coughs> this is the situation where um, a task has exactly one set of processor tasks, okay? But a hospital may have multiple heart surgeons, will have a large nursing staff, and so on, okay? So this is the more general problem where a single, a single task may be worked on by multiple alternative set of processors. So you could have one heart uh, surgery team and another heart surgery team and another heart surgery team and then you have to basically decide two things. Which one to, to use for this patient and when to schedule it, okay? So, so now it's a, this is a bit more complex problem as you can see, right? Because it's not just the scheduling part, it's also pick one of those uh, surgery teams that, that can do the task as well. Okay, so this is, in this case, so let's say for this task, may have two processors. It can only be worked on by processor one, or it can be worked on by processors two and three simultaneously, okay, and so on. And this is going to be, if you get these um, uh, inputs, uh, this is a possible uh, schedule, okay, so for the... Uh, uh, task J4, okay, you can see J, J4 here, you have three possible ta uh, processor sets, one or two or three, and in this case you've decided to schedule it on processor one, okay. Uh, I1, it can be scheduled by one or two and three, and here you've chosen two and three, okay. So you have two decisions to make, basically. All right, okay, is that, is that clear? Okay, now. The question is, how does that relate to RSA? Okay, and here's how it relates to RSA. Basically, what we have shown is that if you look at any network, any general topology network, the RSA problem that I discussed earlier is a special case of this multiprocessor scheduling problem. So l let's look again at this very small network, right? And let's say that f uh, for traffic from N1 to N3, N1 to N3, well, you can go this way, okay? Or you can go this way, that's this set. Or you can go this way, that's the other path. Or you can go this way, so that's this path, okay? So think about this now. 
So the way to do the transformation from one set of problems to the other set of problems is to say that, look, <coughs> Continue? Okay. Yeah. So what are the processors here? The processors are the links because a demand will use a number of links. Okay. And the how you know, the spectrum the spectrum that the demand requires is equivalent to the um, to the time that the task takes in the scheduling problem. Okay. And so uh, no, so basically what I have here is the, and each demand is a task, okay? So these are the demands, and these are the alternative set of processes for each demand. And so this problem basically um, uh, translates to a multiprocessor scheduling problem. So for instance here, for N1 to N4, N1 to N4, I have decided to use the direct link, okay? So I, I use the direct link to go there, okay? And, and so on and so, actually this is for N4 to N1, the, the same thing, okay? So I've used that, and so now what I've done is I've taken this problem, I've converted it into a scheduling problem, and here's the solution, all right? Here's an optimal solution that is based on this transformation from the RSA to the scheduling, okay? So this is the important part, right? I mean. As long as we are, you know, as everyone is clear with how this is done, then I don't need to talk about RSA anymore, okay? All I need to do is I'm going to do all my work on the scheduling domain, okay? Because now, I, you know, once I solve the scheduling problem, I can take the solution and transform it back to the RSA problem, and I'm done. And why I'm going to use scheduling? Because scheduling has been studied for 50 years, right? There's a lot of, you know, literature uh, from which I can draw to get really good solutions, okay? So are there, if there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer any questions here because this is really the critical part. Once we understand that RSA is a special case of, of scheduling, I don't need to talk about RSA. I, I can just discuss scheduling from now on, all right? Is it the synchronous and the asynchronous process? I'm sorry? This is all synchronous processing because all the tasks have to be worked on by the same, by the processors at the same time, okay? okay. <coughs> the, my question is regarding the first part of the elastic uh, from the conductor. Mm -hmm. uh, you uh, talked about uh, the spectrum transduced. Yes. Correct. So how to deal with this problem? All right, so. If you can do it in not continuous, can you do it and continuous? It will be more flexible. Yes, you're absolutely right. So if I can do non-contiguous assignments, then it's easier. And the non-contiguous assignment is the same thing as uh, allowing preemption in the scheduling problem because the, the spectrum corresponds to time. So if I can break the spectrum, that means I can break the time, I can make it non, uh, I, I can allow preemptions, okay? S and, and now from the point, from the scheduling point of view, it's easier, okay? However, the problem with non-contiguous spectrum allocation is that it is, it may or may not be technically feasible in the optical domain. Now. Um, there is a technique, so I, I'm going to make a part. We haven't looked at this problem. This is actually one of the issues that we are planning to address in the future. But there's a technique that is used in SONET that is called virtual concatenation. In virtual concatenation, you take a demand, and instead of sending it through down one path, you may actually spread it along multiple paths. And what you do is you take the demand, let's say it's an OC12, uh, and you break it into four OC3s, and you break it, send it down in, in multiple paths. So that then is a preemptive version of the problem, right? Because once you've broken it down into four or three, you can assign different spectrum to this. It doesn't have to be contiguous, right? So the answer is that it is possible to do that. We haven't looked into that problem, but there's a lot of interesting problems. And if you are interested in working with that, you know, I'd be more than happy to, uh, you know, to uh, collaborate. It's a very interesting problem, but it, it requires different techniques. 
Okay. Yes. Uh, what do you mean by that? The lock frame. You can assign a pass and another one, another one which I need need it later. Mm -hmm. so the system will be blocked. Oh uh, yeah. So th th there is no blocking here. Okay. So the reason there is no blocking is because this is an offline version, it's not an online version. Okay. Yeah. So we haven't looked at the online <laughs> version. So if that's another possible possible direction of future research, to look at the online version. Uh, but but right now it is non-blocking because it's offline. Yes. Maybe uh, my question is related to what uh, Dr. Reda asked. We understand the Jura Chigir is very nice, okay. But now is it some sort of dynamic writing mm -hmm. It's not a static. Right, right. So he is going to decide which rules are going to be used and depend on what are you programming as a node itself uh, for s more secure rules, shortest rules, mm -hmm. or what? Right. So the, the the routing part. I mean, you can uh, uh, you can specialize it any way that you want. So I mean, if you want to put constraints onto the routing, um, it's it's certainly possible to do that. Okay. Um, if you are going to do dynamic routing. There's other issues here, which is what happens is that in any dynamic system, like in memory storage, right? You write files and then you delete files. You write files again, you delete files again. You get fragmentation. Okay. So this is an offline solution, and you know when we say here that we try to minimize the idle times, really in in you know from a computer uh, 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 from a computer memory point of view is minimize fragmentation. Okay. Now, if you have a dynamic environment where you basically, this demand goes away, now you are left with a fragment there. And when you do a dynamic version of the problem, that's why it's very different than what we've done, is what you want to be able to do is do some defragmentation from time to time to, uh, yeah, to collect every free uh, spectrum in a big block that you can assign from, okay? Because if you end up, you know, with small blocks like that, they will not fit your demand. So the point is that dynamic versus offline is very different. Okay, so what I'm talking about here is the static or the offline version of the problem. And again, we haven't really looked at the dynamic problem, but but this is certainly an area of, of further research. Okay. So you are working only here. This example applies for fixing. Yes, so you're given a traffic demand matrix and you want to do the routing and spectrum assignments. And, you know, so, th so th and that's how typically, you know, w w the way that carriers work, right, is exactly like that. So what they will do is they will look at forecast demands, will, uh, will do the assignments, okay, and that will stay there for a few days or weeks at least before they need to change it. And then, the, once there's a change in the traffic patterns, then you update it and so on. Okay. <laughs> Dr. John, the fixed routing has a whole lot of problems. Because, for example, for example, mm -hmm. if the road from V1 to V2 is broken mm -hmm. and it is fixed, what are you going to do? Uh, okay. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And so it is possible to have, um, um, you know, um, augment the problem to take into consideration uh, the uh, uh, survivability requirements, which we have not done. But it's certainly possible to say that um, in addition to routing and wavelength assignments or uh, routing and spectrum assignment here, what you may also want to do is allocate spare capacity. And we can do that. They can be introduced and say, build in some spare capacity along the various links so that if a link goes down, then I can I reroute my demands over that link. Um, this is you know, looking at protection and survivability meca mechanisms. Uh, we haven't looked into that. Okay? But it's certainly possible to take that into account. And of course, yeah. it's a important. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, absolutely. I mean, it's. <coughs> Uh, convergence with 
Correct, yes, yes. All right, so compare with in terms of what? I'm, I'm trying to. In terms of the efficiency of such TVs. Mm -hmm. yeah, right, so uh, in terms of the efficiency, we are comparing towards the lower bounds. And there's an easy way to compute the lower bound here. What I'm going to, some of the results I'm going to show you is, is how we do in terms of the lower bound. Because, you, yes. Oh, okay, yes. Yeah. <laughs> nice to meet you. R right, right, right. Yeah. <coughs> so, um, r r right. So, but no. Th really, the the issue is I'm going to find good solutions for the RSA problem. And what I'm what I said earlier is that, you know, if I just take the solutions that have been used uh, that are based on network design, it doesn't really get me there. I mean, I can get good solutions, but maybe I can get better using this and, and this is what I'm gonna show you so yes we can get really good solutions from this okay now here's the problem okay um, this multiprocessor scheduling problem is NP hard okay of course most scheduling problems are NP hard okay that, that's no surprise what it, it turns out that this these two problems that I told you are very very hard so they're even hard for three processors, okay? Even for a three processor system, there are hard problems to solve, okay? And three, I mean, you can imagine three processor systems are toy systems, right? I mean, now I, I understand you have a uh, high performance computing system that has 500 processors and how many cores per processor, right? 12,000 cores total, right. So 12,000 cores total, you know, this is the kind of scalability we would like to get, not to three, three processors, okay? So, um, the, the yes? Just today, Congratulations, okay. that's great, yes. So, um, and so you can imagine if you have um, big idle times, you know, when you do scheduling, then you are losing a lot of that, right? Because you're not using your, um, your course uh, productively. So uh, th this is where we're going to scale. We want to scale to very large problems. Um, but the, the issue is that the scheduling problems, they are very hard even for a small number of processors. And this is the other thing, okay? Um, uh, many of them are even non-approximable. So in other words, we cannot get constant ratio approximation algorithms. So what we did is we took RSA, um, and which is a hard problem, and I've transformed it to a uh, scheduling problem, which is very hard itself, right? So have we gained anything? And the answer is that the things are not so bad as they seem. And the reason is <coughs> that RSA is actually a special case of multiprocessor scheduling, so it's not a one-to-one -one mapping. So if you think of, you know, this is the universe of the scheduling problems, RSA is only a small subset of those, okay? And here's a very simple example that shows it. Suppose that I have this, so in other words, I can transform RSA to processor scheduling, but the reverse is not possible, okay? So if I have these tasks, okay, so th this is an instance of the, a scheduling problem, okay? So as you can say here, I have task one that ha can go either one, two, or four prime, three prime. Two, two, uh, tau two is two, three, uh, or one prime, four prime, and so on. So if I look at these first four tasks, okay, and if I try to convert that into an RSA problem, a network problem, then I have this, ring network, okay, all right. But there is no way that I can do, since I only need to have, um, okay, I only have a four processors, that means I only have four links, okay. And 
I cannot map this demand that goes from two to four because I don't have a fourth link, right? So it's a, um, I, have, I have four links and four processors, but the processor problem, I can take the, so what is the issue? The issue is that if I have four processors, I can take any subset of them, right? So I can take one, two, or two, three, three, four, four, one, and two, four, okay? But once I take these processors and I convert them into links, the links are determined by the topology. So if my topology is a ring, okay, so I have my four links, there is no way that I can send traffic from uh, two, two, two to four, yes, two to, uh, so I think, yeah, two to three here, so it, uh, I, I think that's wrong. Okay, so yeah, there is no way that I can send traffic there, okay? So that means a general scheduling problem cannot be transformed to an RSA problem. Therefore, the RSA problem is easier, okay? It's a special case, and because it's a special case, it may be easier, and therefore I can get good solutions, which is what I'm going to show you. Okay, so, now, the idea is I want to solve the problem in a general topology network, okay? But again, the way that I do research is I want to look at, uh, I want to study the easy cases first, understand the problem, uh, then move on to the more difficult cases. Okay, so what is the easiest topology? Well, the easiest topology is to look at a chain network, right? A chain network is just a, uh, you know, links that form a single path, and once you have that, there is no issue about r routing because you have an, a, a single path, then you, the, you can't route otherwise, okay? So you basically have a spectrum assignment problem. You don't have a routing. Okay, so let's, so this is the first paper that we had um, where we looked at the spectrum assignment in this, um, uh, okay? And what we said is that, look, um, we have this multiprocessor prob uh, problem, and if you have the SA on a chain network, then these are equivalent, okay? And it turns out that um, if you have um, three links, so if you only have three links, or in other words, three processors, you can solve the problem um, polynomially. There, there's no issue, okay? However, once you get to four links, the problem becomes NP-hard. The proof is in that paper. Again, I'm not going to get into all the technical details. It's actually a transformation from the partition problem. So we can show that for four links, the problem is NP-hard. Okay. Now, <coughs> can we do anything about that? The answer is that we can. And it turns out that for four links and five links, there's 1.5 approximation algorithm. Again, I'm not gonna give you all the details of those. The, uh, it's in the paper, okay. But what I'm going to do is, now that I have this 1.5 approximation algorithms for four and five links, okay, which means that if I use these algorithms, I will never be more than 50% away from the optimal, okay. And, in, 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 uh, and that's in the worst case. In the average case, I'm going to show you that we are actually less than 3% from the optimum, but I'm going to get to that in a moment, okay? Now what I, I can do is um, we can uh, use the scheduling ideas to develop approximation algorithms for more links than four and five. And the way to do that, okay, this is the description, but I'm not going to give you the description. I'm going to show you the figure. What we are going to do is this. So think again as a scheduling problem. Forget about the routing problem and the spectrum assignment problem. Just a scheduling problem, right? So I have these processors, one through M, okay? And I'm gonna schedule tasks on those, okay? And I'm given those tasks. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do something like this. I'm gonna take the middle third of processors, okay? And I'm gonna take the tasks that only require those middle processors, okay? And because, remember, this is a, a, a chain network, um, and because, and, and this is the nice thing about the, the, net, the RSA problem, which is a special case, I will never require processor one and processor M together. Why? Because a demand, if it starts at node one, it will have to continue to two, to three, four, et cetera, uh, to be scheduled, right? So if uh, a demand starts from one and 
uses all the links up to M, then it will certainly use the links in the middle, and I'm going to consider it as part of this set. Okay. Then I'm going to take the demands that only use this top third of the links, and I'm going to take the demand that use only the bottom third of the links. Now what I have is the following. Since I'm going to use all the demands that use these links here, okay, what happens is if I have a demand that starts at 1 and uses, let's say, k plus 1 here, and a demand that starts over here and uses k plus 1, they will have to be scheduled independently, okay, because they have a, s a common processor. And remember, a processor must work on a particular task, uh, one task at a time. Okay. So what I can do is the following. I only need to make sure that any task that uses these middle processors um, does not overlap with any other task that uses the same processors. Okay. So if I have an approximation algorithm for you know, however processors they are here, I can use that approximation algorithm and I'm going to get this. Okay. Now I'm going to take the, the tasks that only need the top third of the processors. These tasks do not need these processors or these processors, so they can be scheduled independently. Okay. So if I have an approximation algorithm that solves these, uh, you know, solves uh, tasks with this number of processors, I can use them and schedule them here. Okay. And then I'm going to do the same thing over there. Okay. Now, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to build two schedules, one after the other, one that schedules all the tasks that require the middle processors, and then two that will be running in parallel, those that run that only require the top thirds and those that require the bottom thirds of the processors. These do not have any processors in common, so I can schedule them uh, in parallel. Okay. These ones... I cannot schedule them in parallel because there could be a task here that requires, let's say, processor 1, which is here only, but then a task here that requires processor 1, blah, 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 plus k plus 1, right? So I cannot schedule them in parallel because then I would not be able to, uh, yeah, I may have overlaps, which I, I cannot have, all right? So if I have an approximation algorithm for this, an approximation algorithm for this, then the overall approximation of this algorithm will be whatever the approximation algorithm of this is, plus the maximum of the approximation algorithm for these two, right? So now I have a new approximation algorithm, okay? So what this means is the following, right? If I have between six and nine processors, then I'm going to break it into uh, processors of at most three, and since I can solve three or less processors optimally, that's approximation of one, then the total will be an approximation of 2. If it is between 10 and 13, the ratio is 2.5 because I'm going to have just one set with a, you know, it's going to be th four or five processors with approximations of 1.5 and one with three. So one plus 1.5 is 2.5 and so on. So, you know, if you do the arithmetic here, basically what this is saying is that, you know, for basically, okay, for a network, for a network setting where the diameter of the network typically is never more than 10, okay? So I'm basically around here. So at, at about 2.5 approximation, okay? That's, that's basically what it says. So I, now, this is, this is new, all right? There was no approximation algorithm for this before, and you can't get to an approximation algorithm using network design theory, right? So this is new stuff that, that uh, we were able to now, the other thing is, what about, what about heuristics? And as I said, scheduling is a well-known discipline for a long time, and there's this class of list scheduling algorithms. List scheduling is very simple. All it says is, take the, list, take the tasks that you have and list them in some order, okay? I mean, it could be a random order. It could be processing time, longest processing time, smallest processing time, you know, uh, different orders, okay? And then start scheduling the task. Take the first from the list and schedule it. Takes the next from the list and schedule it so that it doesn't overlap and so on. Right? So that's the classical list scheduling. Here, what we've used is we've used two criteria to order the tasks in the list. One is longest processor time first. That's because uh, 
tasks with a large processing time are more difficult to schedule, so you want to schedule them first, okay? And then leave the smaller tasks afterwards because these are easier to fit into the, into the schedule. The other order that we used is widest first. Widest means how many processors must work on this task because those that require a lot of processors are also less flexible in how to be scheduled. Those that require maybe only one processor or two processors are easy to fit into your schedule, okay? So this is, so we've come up with algorithms and I'm gonna show you uh, just the results. So we have um, uh, uh, done a lot of simulations. Uh, we've used different traffic demands. Uh, if you can see here, we use demands that correspond to traffic in optical networking. So 10 gigabits, 40, 100, 400, and 1,000 gigabits per second, okay, which would be what uh, you can do uh, with current technology. Um, and then we've done either uniforms, you randomly pick a demand out of these five numbers, or you can have a discrete high which says, you know, um, it's more likely to have larger demands than smaller demands, or a discrete low where you have higher probability for the small demands and smaller probability for the high demands, okay? So the reason we try to, first of all, there's no real traces today of these, right? Because there are no 400 to 1,000 gigabit per second traffic, so we can't really get real data. But the reason we did that is to see, okay, does the distribution um, affect the quality of the algorithms, okay? So here's what we've done, and these are the results, okay? So th as I said, we have two algorithms. One is the widest, the other one is the longest in terms of ordering. And we have two algorithms, so there are uh, uh, two dimensions of classifying them. One is whether we use widest first or longest first to, class to list the tasks, and the other one is whether we do a compact or block-based scheduling, which I'm not going to get into the details, but the compact scheduling typically gets you better results than the block-based scheduling, okay? And so as you can see here, other than the widest first blocks, uh, which uh, gives us um, uh, um, uh, worse performance, the other three are actually doing very well. And let me tell you what the uh, axes are. The axes are the number of nodes in the path, or the number of links, or the number of processors, okay? And the y-axis uh, y is this ratio here, which is the whatever the length you compute from your algorithm divided by the lower bound, right? So the best would be to get to the lower bound, that would be a ratio of one. Anything above that means that you cannot achieve the lower bound, so you wanna see how good you are doing in terms of the lower bound. Now, why not the optimal? Because we don't know the optimal, right? The problem above four, no, above four links is NP hard, so we can't, you know, for 20, you know, if you get to 20 uh, uh, processors here, uh, we probably need the HPC cluster running for several days to get the optimal, right? So that's not feasible to obtain. So we only compare to the lower bounds. We don't compare to the optimal, but as you can see here, um, this is um, very, uh, very good. Less than 5% from, uh, from the lower bound. And does it change with the distribution? So this, what the different graphs are for different distributions. Does it change with the distribution? No, it doesn't. You know, so the distribution doesn't affect the quality of the algorithm, okay? <coughs> now, what happens if instead, so f again, for a network setting, you are never gonna get even 20 nodes in a path. You're never gonna get that, right? I mean, that's too long. So typically, you're gonna have uh, at most 10. But what if you were to run this on a multiprocessor environment where you have thousands of processors? Okay, so we use v similar distributions. And, um, oh, and, and by the way, we are going to eliminate this algorithm. This algorithm doesn't seem to be doing well, so I'm not going to consider it again, okay? So I'm only going to show you for this. So the scale changes now. The scale here goes up to 1.5 or so. The scale here changes. It only goes up to 1.03, okay? So what happens? The more processors, the better the result, okay? It goes down to almost uh, 1 to 2%. Why the better result? Because the more processor you have, the longer the schedule, the more flexibility in terms of scheduling. So you get better results actually as the, uh, <coughs> as the number of processor increases. This is expected. Yes, this is expected. But what is not expected is that you can get within one to 2%, right? That's the whole point. 
So this result that the, the fact that the curves are going down is expected, but uh, you know th this is possible only because of the multiprocessor idea, right? I, I, again, so um, skewed high. So again, it doesn't depend on the distribution. Um, you know the results are, are all within you know two to three percent away from the lower bound. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so some of these may be expected. Some are uh, for this nature. Yeah. So for this pro particular problem, it's kind of expected. But yeah, it also depends on the type of scheduling that you have. So, yeah. Okay. So um, then the next thing. Okay. So we we dealt with chains. You know, single paths. So that's not very important. But at least it allowed us to understand the the nature of the problem. We got some approximation algorithms. What can we do next? Okay, the next thing we did is look at rings. Okay, and and so we looked at rings. Uh, this sorry, is a, yes. Uh, maybe just I would ask you a question sure. about the last slide. Yes. Yes. There is a philosophy. Mm -hmm. We need in the scheduling problem to see to predict or to or to compute how many. Uh, optimal process I have to use because it is economic economic problem okay in that case you are increasing the number of processor and you said okay I get better results but sometimes you have optimal processor to achieve this your better result uh, right, 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 right so no so this is not um, yeah I, I can understand your uh, so, so I'm not saying here that um, I'm, I'm solving the same problem with more processors. That is not what I'm saying, okay? What I'm saying is um, if I have more processors, okay, so look at, you know, I have 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 processors, right? For each set of processors, I generate a traffic demand that is for that specific set, and I make sure that the demands normalized by the number of processors is the same. So in other words, if I use, um, you know, the utilization of the processors is, let's say, 0.6 here. I don't remember the numbers, okay? I'm just, you know, uh, thinking out loud. Let's say if this is 0.6 for 1,000 processors, it is 0.6 for 2,000, 0.6 for 3,000, so So in other words, the, the amount of demands that I send to the system is also proportional to the number of processors. So it's not that I'm solving the same problem. So I'm solving a different problem here than I'm solving here because this is more demands, okay? Right? <coughs> okay, so I, I, I know that I'm running out of time, but um, let me just uh, tell you a little bit about ring networks, okay? And the way that ring networks uh, happens is that you can have uh, unidirectional rings or bidirectional rings. So we've studied both, okay? Now it turns out that there's some very interesting thing. So typically, you know, uh, for, uh, I'm not going to uh, really talk about unidirectional rings because these are not uh, used in practice. So I'm only going to talk at bidirectional rings. So here's the thing, okay? If I have bidirectional rings and shortest path routing, if I do shortest path routing, that means the routing part goes away. I only have spectrum assignment, okay? Then the problem is polynomial for three nodes or four nodes, okay? So ring network with bidirectional, with shortest path routing and three or four pro, uh, uh, nodes, problem is solved optimally, okay? But here's the thing, okay? If I make a small change to the problem so that one of the demands does not take the shortest path and all the other demands take the shortest path, the problem becomes NP half, okay? Now, how do we, I mean, the proof is in the, this paper. The proof is actually from the scheduling point of view, not from the RSA. We wouldn't be able to do that proof if we're just looking at the network problem. We were able to do that because we're looking at the scheduling problem. But, you know, so, so you can think that the, the, there is a, a complexity cliff, right, where you go from an easy problem to a very hard problem by making just a small change in the assumption. So, for instance, so this is a four-node network. 
all the two hop demands take the shortest path, and then one of the demands, instead of going over the shortest path here, I make it take the longer path, okay? Well, that problem is NP hat, okay? <coughs> now, um, in uh, five nodes with shortest path routing, the problem is NP hat, and this is the proof from the partitioning problem, which I'm not gonna get into, okay? Now, um, if you look at the RSA problem, so now, so the, the previous results are when you use shortest path routing, in which case you don't have routing as part of the problem, it's just a spectrum assignment. If you introduce the routing, remember the routing here is actually very simple. You either go clockwise or you go counterclockwise. You only have two, two, pro, two uh, choices. The, you don't have uh, any other option, okay? Then, if you do look at the routing together with, sort, uh, with spectrum assignment, in three nodes it is solvable polynomially, in four nodes it's NP-complete, okay? Now, it turns out that um, we have approximation algorithms, okay? And uh, it is both for the, um, those with shortest path routing and those in which you have uh, RSA uh, as the problem. And it turns out, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to show you a result of how we get this result for five nodes. Again, just a very high level overview. I'm not going to give you the, um, uh, the, the exact details. But the way that it works is as following, okay? This is a five node ring, okay? It has shortest path routing, okay? So this is, the routing is out of the, uh, is not part of the problem anymore. It has been decided in advance, okay? How can I find an approximation algorithm for it? Okay, the way I'm going to do that is let's look at the links and take the one that has the highest load. Okay, let's say L3 is the highest load. What I'm going to do, remove that from the network, okay? And remove all the demands that use that node, okay? What do I have now? What I have is a chain network. So now I can reuse all the results that I had before, okay? And I can do the scheduling here, okay? And I can, since I can, this is a form, okay, so I can do the scheduling, and then I can, let's say this is the schedule, okay? Now, what happens with the demands that I deleted here, okay? So I had these three demands that I deleted. What, what I'm gonna do with them? Well, I'm gonna schedule them because they may overlap with some of these other demands uh, in terms of the links that they use or the processors in the processing problem. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna schedule them here. And there's a reason why I chose the highest load link, because this is the lower bound, okay? So when I schedule this, this is optimal, and I know it's less than the lower bound, because this is the lower bound. It's determined by that link L3, okay, that I removed. And this is the lower bound. Now, since I only have tasks that deal with that particular link, I can schedule them optimally at the lower bound because uh, I can just put them one after the other. There's no point, okay? So a naive lower bound would be one plus one equals two. So a two approximation algorithm, okay? However, that's if you don't look very closely, if you do look very closely, and I'm not gonna do the arithmetic which is up here, it turns out that you can take this and slide it back here, as you can see here, Processor three is empty because I haven't used it, right? So what I can do is I can slide it. Now, how far can I slide it? It depends on the relative, and how I schedule this depends on the relative processing time of these tasks, okay? And so if this is larger, I put this here. If this is larger, I schedule this first, okay? So I, you know, there's ways to do that, okay? And then if you do some of the math here, it turns out you get a 1.5 approximation algorithm, okay? Not a two approximation, which is a naive way of doing it. You get a 1.5, all right? Um, so, and then you can do similar uh, ideas to get approximation algorithms for larger rings, okay? You break it with a max, you schedule this, then you put the schedule together for the task that require this, just like with the five uh, processor scheme, and, and you solve the problem, okay? So uh, what you get is 1.5 for four nodes, two for five nodes, three plus for the other nodes, and depends on the number of nodes, okay. 
And how good are these results, okay? Uh, if I implement these nodes, this is, a, remember, these are the worst case approximation algorithms, right? On average, how well do we do? And it turns out we do quite better than that. For five, it is, so these are different distributions like before, okay? So this is the number of nodes, and this is the ratio that I had before to the lower bounds, okay? And as you can see, for five, it was two, it was 1.5, but actually I get something that is no more than about 115, uh, so no more than about 15%, okay? For seven, it is, I can't remember, it was 2.5, but then you get something that is around 1.5 and so on, and then it's kind of levels off. So um, instead of being three plus, which was my uh, worst case, I get something around two, okay? So the algorithms actually work very well, okay? Now, last thing, uh, very quickly. Um, the next step is mesh networks, general topological general. This is the work that we've done with, uh, uh, you know, the folks from Fuzitsu, okay? Uh, Mahmoud and Hossam here, and so, um, uh, th they actually made two uh, uh, improvements of the algorithms. One is that for the chain network, they designed a much faster algorithm that is recursive. So, so they solve the chain network uh, with the same um, uh, guarantees, okay? But they do it much faster, okay? Because they take advantage of the nature of the, of the problem and they can do things recursively, whereas we were not taking advantage of that. The second thing we did was that uh, they developed uh, this algorithm, they extended this algorithm for mesh networks, okay? And so this is uh, kind of uh, uh, the idea is that we have a list scheduling algorithms for mesh networks with the same ideas, you know, longest first or widest first as we order the tasks, okay? We have a fast version that is optimized for the chain networks. Uh, we've run, they, they've run, not I, uh, they've run experiments on the, on the HPC system here, okay? And so we are looking at some extensions to that work at this point. Uh, but uh, so this is uh, the examples for mess networks and so for various problem instances, what we can see is that this is again the average ratio. And as you can see here for, um, uh, you know, as the number, uh, the various instances, for most of them, they actually get an optimal solution, okay? And for some of the instances, they get uh, up to 10% away from the optimal, okay? So the, actually this is, to the lower bound, but once you achieve the lower bound, that means you are optimal, okay? And then uh, this is uh, for chain networks, and again, the results are, you know, very similar to what I had before, which is within three to four to five percent, three to five percent, but the solutions here are much faster than the ones that I see, or can be obtained much faster than the ones that I showed you before, okay? So um, I guess I presented three journal papers, <laughs> in, uh, or four papers actually, uh, in, in uh, one hour. Uh, the other thing I want to say is that this paper was, uh, I think I mentioned that earlier, it was just um, accepted this last week and will be presented um, at the conference in August. Um, so that concludes my talk. Uh, just a couple of words about possi other possibilities. So. First of all, we've just started to scratch the surface of the problems that are related to mesh networks, okay? So there's a lot of more work that can be done, uh, and so that's a certainly a possible di direction. Um, another possibility, especially now that, that you have uh, HPC systems and data centers, uh, you know, the, there's a lot of uh, interest in uh, trying to um, uh, adapt optical network architectures for data centers, okay? There's a lot of really nice ideas. Uh, one that I have, uh, you know, that um, <coughs> uh, th that may be, in fact, kind of um, uh, radical is to use um, uh, ready over fiber. So use um, uh, free space optics to interconnect. So one of the problems with data center networks is right, you have this huge cable uh, problem of uh, interconnecting everything, right? And so that's one thing. The other thing is that you have this hierarchical uh, structure where you don't get the full bisection bandwidth, which is very important because you, you have to concentrate towards the middle of the, you know, the top tiers of the network 
and then you don't get the full bisectional bandwidth, which is very important in terms of, of moving data between the various parts of the data center. What if you had, an, uh, you had a, uh, the possibility of uh, taking that, um, uh, uh, that uh, network infrastructure away? So not use, not use cable links, fiber links, just use free space optics to have the various racks communicate directly to each other so you can have uh, single hop solutions as opposed to hierarchical ones. Another one that I actually discussed with Dr. Batarfi, who's, uh, uh, who's visiting our university, uh, but uh, unfortunately we didn't have the chance to get to put together a proposal, is there's a lot of work on visible light communication. So if you're familiar, you know, there's these LED lights that are very popular now, that, that, but now not only can you get better performance because or you know, lower cost, higher energy efficiency because they are LEDs, but now you can also modulate the visible light that comes out of them so that you can um, <coughs> use it like Wi-Fi, okay, to connect um, uh, laptops, uh, uh, PCs, cell phones, and, uh, and, and so on, okay? Uh, now, th there is some constraints there because when you do visible light communication, you have to have a line of sight communication between them, okay? But there's a large, um, you know, there's a lot of interest in that area. You know, there's, so for instance, for um, industrial environments where you have a lot of interference for Wi-Fi type networks, well, there is no such issue with uh, visible light communications, okay? Uh, or if you want something secure, there is, you know, if you're using Wi-Fi, someone outside may intercept the signal, right? If it is visible light communications, nothing leaves the room, okay? So there's a lot of advantages to using this type of visible light communications. Of course, there is a lot of challenges. That's, that's why it's a very interesting research area, okay? And then uh, finally, uh, and I'm gonna talk more about this um, uh, tomorrow when I talk about software defined networking. In fact, we do have a proposal that was uh, accepted, I guess, that, uh, you know, to build a software defined lab um, uh, here at the, <coughs> at the department, and, and I believe we're still waiting for the funding to come through. Uh, and, and there's a lot of, um, uh, you know, uh, interesting research areas in software-defined networking, and this is, in fact, one of the uh, exploding areas of research in the, in the last two or three years. Okay, and with that, I'll stop here, and, and I'll be happy to take questions. <coughs> Line, uh, drawbacks in uh, yeah the drawback is that uh, you you have to have direct line of sight. Uh, this is, uh, 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 well, I mean, if you have uh, LEDs in the room, right? So I mean, there, there's uh, of course, um, you know, how do you place them so that you can get cover ads throughout the room? But but yeah, so that that's one of the research issues is how to place them in the in an office building, for instance, in order to to maximize. Um, performance yeah it, it's a challenging problem but 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 there's a lot of benefits that that's why it's becoming very important yeah all right thank you very much for <coughs>